Hey, everybody, and welcome to Learning from Smart People. I am your host, Rob Oliver, and I'm... I tell you this every time at the beginning of every episode, I'm excited for today. And the reason for this is that my smart person today is not just smart, but she's fun. Okay. And so my guest today is April Lynn James. She is a pioneering entrepreneur, a speaker, an author, and a soprano. She is the corporeal half of April plus Madison, a Wonderland-inspired expressive arts and holistic wellness enterprise fueled in part by the whimsical rhymes composed and declaimed by her guardian angel, Madison Hatta Sonneteer. She is also a PhD and she is now officially a smart person. April, welcome to the show. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you for having me, Rob. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about this. Like we were talking about this in the in the pre-interview. And I tell me, who is Madison? For the folks that are out there are like, okay, you're talking about corporeal and whimsical and all of these fun words that like I feel like I'm on, you know, like Buddy the Elf, like Francisco. That's fun to say. Um, talk to me about this and talk to me about Madison and, and explain a little bit about yourself if you don't mind. Okay, well, goodness, (laughs) a little bit about Madison, a little bit about myself. So, yeah, Madison, so when I say that April plus Madison, you know, is that I'm the corporeal half, I mean that I'm the embodied half, you know, I hear in a human body. And Madison is the non-corporeal half. And the way... Madison came into my life. I'll just say that I was not intending this. This is not a, a career direction I was intending. At the time, I was actually working on my singing career. I was in New York, and I was in the middle of really trying to figure out what was going on with my life because I was helping my mother through a health crisis mm. and trying to have a career. And things just weren't going anywhere. So I had just come from a job fair with a colleague who was a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And she had two tickets to the Tim Burton film, Alice in Wonderland, and asked me if I wanted to go. And I was like, oh, um, I actually said no. (laughs) I actually tried to get out of it. But, you know, it was... The, the Directors Guild Cinema was on my way to the subway. And so I went in, I was like, oh, well, I'll just use the bathroom, you know? And then and then it was five minutes before movie time. And she's like, really, you want to leave? And I'm like, okay, okay, I'll go. <laughs> right. And, and so, um, and it was my first 3D film, I had to say. It was the only, it was the first 3D film I, I was going to see. And that, I think that was, I was like, oh, I'll just go see it because it's 3D, okay. So the minute the film comes on the screen, it's just like, I am transfixed. I am hooked. The music got to me, conjured up images of innocence and magic, and the visuals really caught me too. And I started to really resonate with Alice's story, her hero's journey. And then, you know, what really really did it was that... um, in the mad tea party scene where the hatter is, he, he wakes up and he sees Alice coming from a clearing and his face fills the screen. And the moment his face filled the screen, I heard inside my head, that's me. And I'm like, what? You know, and I'm like, me who? And no reply to that. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, you know, it's a good thing that I, I've been interested in spirituality my entire life, you know, so psychic experiences and stuff weren't, weren't really foreign to me. I was just like, okay, that's something I'll deal with it later. But when I came came out of the theater, I was just like, I was, I felt more alive than I'd felt in many months. And I developed over the course of that next year, an obsession with, the Hatter and 
all things related to Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, just like I just started reading a whole lot and being like, what, what's going on here? This is really compelling to me for some reason. Uh, a year and change after seeing the film, I'm looking up online um, screensavers, you know, wallpaper for my Mac. And I'm looking for Alice in Wonderland specific wallpaper. And I happen upon one that had this poem that was sort of, it was, you could tell they were writing it in a Hatter-ish style. Right. And I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, that might be a, not a good wallpaper. And that voice, man, it popped up in my head again. It said, I could do better. And I'm like, okay <laughs> I'm like what do you mean and then i hear again well look it's not even a proper form it needs to be a sonnet i'm like okay so i i you know i go i'm like all right let me look first i looked up sonnet in the oxford american dictionary just to make sure i remembered it for, because i'd taken creative writing years ago but i want like what's sonnet? okay 14 line poem okay i can like all right so i take out a paper and pen and it it didn't take more than 15 minutes it came the first sonnet if i were not mad came through just from beginning to end and the name madison hatter came right along with the sonnet and i'm like all righty then <laughs> there you go. I, so i love that there is a whimsical nature to it there is a fun part of it and and the Madison had to, I had not picked up on the connection there, but now that you bring out, okay. So you have, you have kind of it, what sounds to me like an English kind of voice that is kind of your, your muse or your inspiration that comes to you at, at different times. Um, and how do you, how do you react when there's people that are like, okay, Apparently, April hears voices. Does, <laughs> does does this mean that she is, you know, crazy or what? What it, like? What's your reaction to that, or how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, no one said it that way yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you know, people know that I'm a creative person, so I think they just go, "Oh, yes, she's just being creative." Uh, yeah, you know, people will say, "Okay, you." Yeah, I'll say guardian angel and they'll think alter ego. Oh, she's just being a performer. She's just pretending that they did. I'm like, all right, whatever. However you need to experience it, that's fine. I know how I'm experiencing this. <laughs> okay. And actually, let me, I, I want to kind of key on that for a minute. And that is, there. It, it's to say, like, you know how you experience it. And other people can say, I think this is how she experiences it, or I, I, they can rationalize it. But each of us has our own way of dealing with kind of the circumstances of our own life and the, the way that we are creative. And um, I think it's really, it's really powerful to be able to, to do something that other people don't really necessarily understand and to say, I don't need you to understand it. I just need you to let me do my thing. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you have kind of this, you've got this muse, you have this inspiration and, but then you, now let me just ask this. Were you, when your performance and your singing and everything, did you ever have like the, the corporate experience before that? Or were you always a singer or kind of what's the backstory there? Well, I've always been a singer. So I'm the earliest um, the earliest memories I have are of myself singing on the swing set that my parents built for me in our backyard in in uh, Queens, <laughs> New York. So I've I've sung since I think since I could breathe, right? I, and um the thing is I'd never I never tried to make it a career until after I'd been through Harvard, after I'd done some of the corporate stuff. Um, and, you know, it was because, because when I actually, when I first went to school, when I first did my first undergraduate degree was in communications. I had, 
I thought about music, but I was discouraged from doing it by my mother, who was a teacher. Both my parents were teachers. <laughs> and uh, she, she had said, you know, well, music is a hobby, not a career. And so I listened to that. And it's taken me a long time to finally be okay with having listened to that. <laughs> because, you know, okay, so I didn't go into music right away as a like a major and as a career, which I think saved me from a lot of the heartache that people go through when they try to make careers in the arts from a young age. And it kept my joy of singing. Like I always kept my joy of singing, even when it got hard, even when I did that musicology degree up at Harvard and, you know, and it was, that was a really tough experience. And then when I strove to, and I formed my own opera company and strove to really make it as a singer in New York. And that was a hard experience. I never totally lost the joy of singing. And I never, I, ne I never really transitioned into the, into the I'm singing for other people thing, which I think a lot of musicians, well, singers, creative people, you, you stop doing it for yourself and for the connection to spirit and you start doing it for other people, which to me changes it, really changes the art. And so. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let me, I live in a world of analogy. So let me give you my comparison. My daughter, um, who is going into her sophomore year at Duquesne University, is a tremendous baker. She makes amazing cookies and cupcakes and all of this stuff. And I've told her, um, you need to, you need to like do this as a way to pay for school, right? Like start your own cooking business, your own baking business. And in my mind, you will be wildly successful. And yet what you're, it's exactly what you're talking about. She's like, I, I'm not ready to do that. I don't really want to do that because I do this for fun. And I, this is an outlet for me. And if I were to do it as a business, it would take away some of the joy that I have from doing that. Is that kind of what you were talking about? That is exactly it. Yeah. That, and so my life has been one of these things where I'm trying to find something that I can do in addition to doing what it is I naturally do, you know, okay. that's, and that's, so that's been like this dichotomy and the struggle. Okay. So we're, we're talking to entrepreneurs today. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on is because you're a, you're working on a project or working on your endeavor is to help entrepreneurs um, make that connection to fun and to enjoyment and to um, joy that sometimes comes that sometimes is lost because of the the stress that comes with being an entrepreneur. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing with that? Yes. So I've come up with this concept and it's based upon the struggles that I've had to go to. It's, it's a framework, the play framework, you know, that and play is an acronym for positivity, listening to good music, looking at good images, awe instead of awe, and yoga slash movement. And these are the things that I discovered in my own life. I needed to make sure that I had all of these things going so that I could retain the joy, the, the spark of creativity, the connection to the divine. And yeah, you know, recover from burnout because that's what I, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Absolutely. So so let, if you don't mind, let's talk our way through these, all right? We've got four of them. So mm -hmm. your P is for positivity. And, yes. and I love how you, you're spelling it positivity with a T-E-A at the end, which I'm assuming is the connection back to your Mad Hatter. Is that right? Exactly. That is Madison. Yes. And I have a little teacup ring here just on today because it's Madison. I have to, have to always make sure that, you know, Madison is... Always close by. <laughs> Excellent. So let's let's talk about positivity because um, we live we live in a world where we are 
Okay, the Olympics are on, all right? And I was just watching some of the gymnastics, and these are the most well-trained and the best executioners of the gymnastic exercise. And the commentators are like, oh, there's a little bobble there, or there's like her, her foot, you know, her angle wasn't right, or her foot touched this. And, and like they take something that is on the edge of, it's almost as close to perfect as you can get, and they're able to find the faults with it. And sometimes I feel like that's an analogy for life. We go through life, and sometimes people, the key, we key on the negative, yes. and we we're not as aware of the positive. You know, Paul McCartney. I have his. Um, you know, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. You know, don't mess around with mystery in between. How can you? How can you help people, or how do you help people? to change their mindset into that, into a one that focuses on positivity? Well, you start with self-love. And uh, this is something that Louise Hay was, you know, she was a pioneer in this area, you know, working with affirmations. You really have to start with loving yourself. And I love, and I discovered her, you know, when I was going through one of these episodes in my life, um, and her concept of mirror work or mirror play, as she also called it, that you look in the mirror every morning, before, you know, as soon as you wake up in the morning and before you go to bed in the evening and you tell yourself, I love you. I really love you. And I accept you exactly as you are. And no matter what happens to you during the day, if something bad, bad happens, you know, challenging, let's say, you know, someone says someone says something to you that rubs you the wrong way, or whatever it is. You you know, as soon as possible, get to a mirror and and remind yourself, "I love you. I really love you." Or just you know, say it to you. You know, we have these phones, right? We can always turn put it on so we can see ourselves and say, "I love you." It's focusing on that and really looking for that silver lining, which is often there. <laughs> we, you know, we just have to practice. We have to practice being positive. I think sometimes our, our culture and our education helps us practice the opposite. Okay. Um, this is really a powerful shift for me because to me, uh, my reaction is a mirror is actually a negative thing. Okay. Because when you go by the mirror, the mirror shows you that um, you you have a couple more pounds on than you really want to. Or the mirror shows me that my hair is messed up and I need to fix it. Or it shows me that I've slopped on my shirt. You know, the, the mirror allows me, gives me a reflection. And maybe the, I'm burdening everybody else with my personal, um, you know, experience. But oftentimes the mirror we use a mirror in a negative way to help us see what's wrong. And of course, to fix that. But mm -hmm. you're saying um, in a very different way that the mirror is a chance to reflect and to to let yourself know that you are okay and that you are loved just just be, by being who you are. Is, is that right? That's right. That's exactly it. Let the mirror be your friend. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to walk around with a shirt that's stained, right? You wouldn't want to go around with a shirt that's stained. So, you, you know, you have a friend who's like, hey, um, you need, might need to change that shirt before you go into that interview. That's all. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, and it does make sense. And that it, in that way, the mirror is, it, the mirror is, it, it, okay, I'm going to go back. And I think that I've probably beat this to death, but. The mirror is not positive or negative. Right. <laughs> um, it is your reaction to the mirror that ultimately makes the difference. Okay. That is it. That is it. Yes. All right. So L is about listening to music and you say listening to good music. And I'm okay. I've got some teenagers that live in my house and those teenagers will tell me, dad, your music is terrible. And yet I think it's good music. So when you're talking about listening to good music, enlighten me on your definition of good and um, on how that works. So the definition of good in the sense that it connects you to 
the good, right? It connects you to the positive source of all life, which is, you know, which you can call spirit. You can call our divine source. It's music that helps you to calm down. It can, it can be music that, you know, you move around to, like, has a good beat, easy to dance to, you know, that kind of thing. It can be that kind of music. But it also is more often what's termed classical music, right? It's music that helps you to calm down to, and to center yourself. And music that you can focus on that that has it, it, it has positive if it's vocal music then it has positive lyrics you know it's not putting people down not putting anything down it's it's building you up it's uplifting it and and you want to i mean i like to encourage people to find artists who are inspired who know that that their music doesn't come just from them as a little self, but that it actually comes from a deeper source, a, a, a divine source. And, you know, that they're conscious of what they're putting into their music because music is vibration. You know, we're taking in vibrations. Why not take in the highest vibrations to lift yourself, you know, <laughs> instead of being weighed down by the gravity of every situation? No, no, no. Okay. Um, so, I think that what you're talking about is having kind of a a deeper a deeper thought about your music than just like I listen to this because this is the music that I grew up with and this is the music that kind of makes me happy. Although listening to music that makes you happy doesn't seem like a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. If music uh, makes you happy, yes. <laughs> but also being selective to say I'm going to make a choice to look at, you know, it's not just, as you said, it has a nice beat. You can dance to it. I'll give it a 97, um, you know, but there is, I'm choosing artists who, and I'm choosing lyrics that are going to be uplifting to me and that whose message resonates with me mm-hmm. and, and who are going to, to fill, to fill my ears and by filling my ears, therefore fill my mind with a message that is something that builds me up and not tears me down. And also mm-hmm. I think that you, you mentioned this, it's not, it's about making sure it doesn't tear other people down as well. So exactly. that just because there's a lot of times I feel like people go through life and the way to make themselves feel better is to make other people look small. Yeah. And so they tear down other people to make themselves look big. And that's, that's going to be a detrimental place to be in the world. Okay. So um, your A stands for awe. Um, it stands for awe. Oh, it stands for awe. Yeah. Awe. So it's, it's not just looking at um, videos of cute rabbits and, and cute kittens on YouTube, right? There's, um, tell me a little bit about what it means. It's about opening up to inspiration. So, and and, you know, that's like, what what I was talking about with Madison, you know, I, I mean, I was in this, obviously, going into a movie, you know, movie puts puts you in a receptive kind of mode. If you you know, when you think about movies, you're going into a darkened theater, you are, mm, in some sense, letting others fill you with images. You know, you're being very receptive in a movie theater, but. Also, you can be receptive outside of the movie theater. You can be relaxing and inspiration comes to you. This, this is the, the still small voice that is our connection to our creator. It's, you know, it's like, it's oh, the way God speaks to us and can come to us in literary form so we could write you know it can come as literary inspiration lewis carroll actually you know his alice books actually a lot of his works were works of inspiration before they were works of perspiration you know right um and uh, and mozart would talk about how you know after a particularly after a good meal and he'd gone he's going for a walk or he's having a good carriage ride sometimes that's where he would hear the music that he would write down. 
And so awe is about also just opening up for divine guidance, which people do. Sometimes they use tarot cards to do this or numerology or, you know, they <laughs> you know, open up a page of a book, you know, a spiritual book and see what, you know, what their eye is drawn to immediately. And that's their guidance for the day. Right. So that's what awe is about. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a sense of being in awe of what is around you and um, having a, a connection to look in some ways to seek inspiration. Yes. Okay. You can even get, you can, you can go to the ocean or right. go out into the mountains and be inspired. Sure. All right. Yeah. So last one is why, and that is for yoga, mm -hmm. um, which is very different than yogurt, but I, <laughs> I would talk to me a little bit. And from what I'm understanding and what I'm hearing you say, it's not, it's not just yoga specific practices, but it's the, it's the art of movement. Is, is yes. that right? Yes. It's yoga slash movement because yoga, well, I do, I do yoga. I do, I have a Hatha yoga practice, but it's, you know, beyond that, it's, Finding ways to move that are enriching to the body and that release stress. So it can be Hatha yoga. You can do that. You can dance. You can juggle. And I teach people to juggle. I've, I've taught workshops in juggling for stress relief. And I find that that's a really fun way to release stress. Uh, really. And, you know, and it's not just about three objects in the air. You can also, there's contact juggling where you just have one object that's in contact with a part of your body the entire time. If you remember the juggler, Michael Motion, he did contact juggling. And it's all just about a focused attention, right? It's kind of like getting your mind off of that computer screen that you've been staring at for hours, right? <laughs> doing something else. So you, so it just frees you up, frees your energy. Yeah. Okay. I, all right. So one of the things juggling is something that was near and dear to me. I, I wait, I'm, I think I'm giving away my age at this point, but there was um, juggling for the complete klutz. Was uh -huh, a, that's how I started. It was a book. Yeah. I got it. I got the little, I got the bean bags with it. And um I, I started and I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. And I, like his first exercise is basically like throw the beanbag up in the air and then just let it fall. And I'm like, right. I've perfected that part. <laughs> now what do I do? But I, it, it is actually one of the things that I miss from uh, as a result of my injury. All right. So mm -hmm. and the other piece that you were saying is that it's, it's about motion. But if, the, if you use the letter M, plam does not go and, <laughs> Yeah. Nearly as well as play does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. April, you've been fantastic. If people are looking to learn more about you and about what you're doing, where can they find you? They can find me at, on my website. So it's you know, www.aprilplusmadison.com, which, which is A-P-R-I-L, and then P-L-U-S, Madison, like Madison Avenue, M-A-D-I-S-O-N.com. Uh, yeah, wonderful. And I, I will make sure that I include a link to that in the show notes and you know to any of your social media and stuff. You have a, an offer for an ebook. Tell me about that. I do. I have an ebook entitled "Well, April Plus Madison's Ten Ways to Play It Forward," and it's a tips book. Ten tips. Ten, ten different ways that you can incorporate play into your day, into your week, into your life. Yeah, I love it. And um, the it's 10 ways to play it forward.com, if I'm not mistaken. And, exactly. That's the same. Yes. And I will, I will put a link to that down in the show notes as well. April, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it is now time for three questions to establish your humanity. Are you ready for these, my friend? I'm ready. What kitchen appliance do you use most? Kitchen appliance? Let me look. Because I'm sitting right here in my kitchen slash studio. Um, well, the tea kettle. 
what, how did I not know that? Right. Uh, so, so what kind of tea are you making? Like, is it like the English tea? Is it like, what kind of tea is that? Earl Grey is my favorite. Okay. That, that works. And I'm, all right. So you mentioned about your subway ride. You're, if you're in New York city, what would you classify as your favorite form of mass transportation? Is it like subway, bus, airplane, trolley, um, ferry? Like what would be, what would be your favorite form? My favorite type. Well, my favorite type of mass transport is actually trolleys or streetcars. That's what I love about European cities. You know, I've been to a lot of different cities uh, in Europe and in Germany, especially, I mean, streetcars are just wonderful. Excellent. All right. So last question for you. I, you're in New York City. And well, I'm actually in Philadelphia. I'm from New York City. Oh, but I'm based in Philly right now. OK, well, if you're from New York City, I will ask you this question. And um, New York is known for its pizza. OK, and <laughs> the question is simple. Pineapple. It is pineapple an appropriate pizza topping or not? No. Okay. I, do, you, do you care to elaborate? I, I say this as a New Yorker. <laughs> you just, the, there are some things that you just don't do to pizza in New York, or you shouldn't do to pizza in New York. <laughs> All right. And I will, at this point, I will tell you that I believe you're 100% correct. And this is, this is my analogy, okay? And that is, just because a tomato is a fruit doesn't mean that it goes in fruit salad, okay? And just because pineapple is on somebody's menu somewhere that you can put it on your pizza doesn't make it right, okay? That, there, there that's, you go. that's my there. analogy. Listen, April Lindy, you have been fantastic. I appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you for sharing. And uh, to all my listeners, thank you for being here. If you have been enjoying the podcast, why not leave us a review on iTunes? We would sure appreciate that. Or go ahead and drop us a line at um, learningfromsmartpeople.com. I will remind you that when you stop learning, you stop living. Have a great day, everybody.